Got it. Okay. okay. Maybe we can. Oh. <laughs> we'll try to go back. So, so before we talk about the language of math, we're, this is what we're going to discuss. We, we, oh, I did, forgot to change that where it says word change, but we just did a re reader generated questions. And, and then we're going to talk about the language of math and get into some text organization and do some activities throughout that. So if we talk about the language of math, um, one of my favorite, um, some of my favorite researchers are Marks and Mousley. And a few things that they say is that mathematicians do use language to make meanings and to share understandings. Um, they, and they talk about how students need to develop control of the genres that are present and valued in mathematics. Um, and it's interesting because not many people think of mathematics as ha um, having or, or containing genres and genre families um, that are universal. They usually try to say, well, math is its own genre or something like that. That may be true to some degree. However, there are some universal things about uh, the key language uses and genre families that that trans that transcend into mathematics as well. Um, and so um, they uh, so Marx and Mousley also say that we have to embrace the range of genres in math in order to expand students' communication skills. Uh, and so, with that being said, let's talk more about what we deal with in mathematics. So we know about Beck and her, coll her colleagues in the, the tier one, tier two, tier three levels of language. Um, so there's that piece, of course. Um, Schlepper Girl talks about grammatical patterns under mathematics. So there's, we have a lot of multi-meaning vocabulary, very dense noun phrases, conjunctions with some very technical meanings. We have some implied relationships. And I would say 90% of mathematics is implied. <laughs> um, and we have more features like homonyms and word clusters and idioms and morphology and all these different things. And then Lemke talks about there being the symbolic notation, graphs and visual displays and then verbal language. Um, and so today we're gonna focus on the graphs and visual displays piece. Um, so uh, a little bit more background. Um, NCTM National Council for the Teachers of Mathematics has uh, developed these process standards Ooh, oh wow, going on 30 years ago now? It's since 1990. And um, so they group process into five categories, um, problem solving, reasoning approved, com communication connections and representations. Now then uh, the Common Core came along and talked about um, the, the standards for mathematical practice, which kind of unpack these further, give you a little bit more detail. And where we're gonna focus today, of course, is gonna be modeling with mathematics. So using these visuals, to help us make sense of mathematics um, and so forth. Um, so here's an example of how visuals can uh, show up and be important in math. Um, in, the, in the world of fractions and decimals, we might use fraction circles. Um, a lot of people, when they start thinking about how to diagram a fraction, they run to a circle, but we also use area models and base 10 blocks and number lines. Um, so there's all these different ways to visualize what a fraction might be. Uh, and so there's a couple of bonuses. One is that this taps into our multiple intelligences, whether it's visual, spatial, or kinesthetic, if they get to like touch the blocks and that kind of thing. Um, and then also it 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 um, flows over into UDL and provides multiple means of representation. And um, and so I think that's where you can really engage students despite what what language proficiency or English language proficiency, I should say, they have. Um, okay. So one more note, um, Bowler and her associates did a study and found out uh, and found that after four 15 minute sessions of playing a game with a number line, the differences in knowledge between students from low income backgrounds and those from middle income backgrounds were eliminated. Four 15 minute sessions, so that's a whole hour of playing games, doing something visual. Mm -hmm. And those 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 differences that that achievement gap that we always talk about was basically eradicated. And that's really that's a really powerful statement. <laughs> yeah. Really, really powerful. And so with that, their recommendations are one, em encourage visual approaches and start replacing memorization and calculation as a primary marker. Uh, and this again taps into the multiple intelligences piece. Um, they even talk about finger use and that it's not babyish. And they found that 
people who still, adults even, who still use their fingers who are more proficient than people who didn't, amazingly enough. Um, and then the third point, which really taps into what we're doing today is making uh, teaching and learning more visual and that there is no concept in mathematics that cannot be visualized. Every single one can be visualized in some way, whether it's on paper or on a computer or using manipulatives, everything can be manip uh, uh, re represented visually, both interpretively and expressively, um, which I wholeheartedly agree with. <laughs> oh, and the, the, the elimination of the achievement gap that does tap into the equity principle for NCTM as well. So mm -hmm. using visuals in math gets, in, gets into a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. So now let's look specifically at WIDA 2020. Um, the guiding principle number six, they talk about um, multilingual learners using and developing language through activities that intentionally integrate multiple modalities, including visual and kinesthetic. Um, and that's really important. And when they get into the content and language integration piece, there's all these things that they talk about. Um, and these are the these are the pieces. Wow, my my things are out of order. These are the pieces that they talk about that involve visuals. And this is seven of them, right? One, two, three, five, seven. Yeah, so those seven, there's 14 in the list. Half of them deal with visuals in some way. And so I think that's something that we really, really have to be cognizant of and that visuals are repeated throughout the guidelines, um, throughout the 2020 guidelines. And so we really need to think about how can we embrace in visuals, uh, sorry, visuals in mathematics um, more often and regularly, not even more often, but just regularly. Um, so all this to say, let's start looking at these key language uses. So let's start with narrative because it's one of my favorites. <laughs> um, so here are three word problems. Take a second and read them through and let's talk about what you notice. Okay. <laughs> <Some What are thoughts? laughs> you don't have to solve them. What are your thoughts about? Oh, I don't just solve. Okay. Yeah, no solving. Right, right. <laughs> well, there's an additional operation as you move up mm -hmm. or two. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, you know, they're all scenarios. Mm hmm. Do you think they could be all represented visually in some way? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yes. No, no, no. Obviously. Obviously. I, that's just a question that popped in my head. Nope. <laughs> you didn't miss anything. I just thought I'd ask. <laughs> you know, the last one, I feel like might be a little difficult. I mean, we would mm -hmm. have blocks or something. I'm trying to mm -hmm. think of how I would represent that visually. But mm hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you know what might be helpful with that one is the Singapore Singapore bar method. Have you ever seen that before? I haven't. Okay. So it's this way of basically representing, um, I'll show you an example in a few minutes, actually, uh, okay. of representing um, the calculation using bars, actually, like drawing out bars, and then you set, you divide them up. It's almost like a fraction bar sort of, sort of situation. Okay. Um, and then you can you can use it to find what's missing. You kind of express a relationship. So, you know, the uh, John working five less than twice as many hours as Jane. So you might have one bar representing Jane, and then you know, kind of manipulate that. Maybe you have a second bar that represents John and manipulate it from there. And then, you 
know, it, it's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. um, or you might put the two bars together because eventually you have to find out how much they each work if they worked 97 hours. So there's ways to play with that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But it's interesting you say that that one's more complex because it should be. <laughs> it's from Algebra 2. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're from different grades. Um, and so what's always fascinating to me and when I talk, start talking to teachers about narrative, the first, uh, the, you know, one of the things I think about is when we start teaching students how to do math, we start with scenarios like this. Jane has nine dolls. Amy has five dolls. You know, the first question I might ask is actually how many do, how many dolls do they have all together? But this one's asking a little bit more complex. Yeah. Um, you know, how many more dolls does Jane have than than Amy? So it's getting into like your basic subtraction, right? Yeah. But I mean, but this is how we start teaching um, students mathematics. We start talking about how many apples this one has. What happens if I give them three more apples? So this is all narrative. It's all <laughs> all narrative scenarios, and it's interesting um, to me because if you think about like the conception of even the field of mathematics, we didn't walk in. You know, people people weren't created talking about you know algorithms. They were trying to represent things that were happening in real life, and so that's really where narrative comes from. Mm -hmm. um, and I would go so far as to say, you know. We, we, we start uh, uh, learning mathematics formally using stories and we keep going. We, I mean, we have stories in calculus and, yeah. and, and you know, and later, like, you know, college level mathematics even. So um, narrative is just something that is pervasive across all, all forms of mathematics. Um, and so of course, according to Derevyanka, um, uh, the purpose, is to entertain or to gain and hold the reader's interest. Um, it can teach or inform or embody the writer's, the writer's reflections as well. Um, but I would say a lot of times we use narrative and math to gain the reader's interest, to give them some sort of hook into the material. Um, because even if you don't know a formal algorithm, you might know, you might understand the scenario. We all know what a doll is, you know, for, you know, or toys. We know we there's things we can put our brain around that, you know, I'm going to get something to eat. I'm trying to get these different things because I'm not just going to eat pizza. I'm going to eat this, I'm going to eat that. You know, so these real life scenarios really help us get into the mathematics. Mm -hmm. And so it might be imaginary, might be factual. And here's some examples. Um, and then the way it's typically organized, narrative is typically organized, is it starts with some sort of intro or orientation, you get into some complication, and then there's a resolution. Yeah. In the case of mathematics, there's usually a framework for a resolution versus the actual resolution. So if we were talking uh, about an ELA example, there would be a resolution to the story. But mm -hmm. in mathematics, we're usually trying to figure out what that resolution should be. Um, and so we're given some questions to ask or to answer um, to help us get to a resolution. Okay, so what does this look like in math? Um, we have ch children's literature and stories. We've got mathematics autobiography sometimes. And of course we have word problems which run, run across all mathematics. Um, one of my former uh, mentors, uh, Michael Skiro talks about uh, the reasons for integrating narrative and mathematics where uh, being that it helps choose children to learn concepts and skills, provides a meaningful context we were just talking about, um, uh, helps to facilitate development and use of language and communication, helps students learn to problem solve and reason and think. And we always talking about high order thinking and that kind of thing in education. And so this falls right along that line, um, provides a richer view of the nature of math and it helps um, improve students' attitudes towards it. Um, sometimes it even helps uh, improve teachers' attitudes towards it. <laughs> I remember um, when I was in Massachusetts, we adopted this text once one one uh, year um, that was uh, was called um, Math Connections, and it was more text based. It was kind of kind of illustrative math like, uh, and so the whole all the mathematics was built around these stories. And uh, one of the teachers that taught the course during the summer, he, his thing wasn't mathematics. And he was like, this is the first time I read about mathematics and understood what was happening. And so his whole attitude, he was a special, he was a special education teacher actually. 
Um, he did pull out. And it was like, this was the first time he really got it. And so from that point, he wanted to teach it all the time. So, you know, it improves art. <laughs> it improves the attitudes for adults too, um, having that kind of approach. So um, narrative, uh -huh. for example, I have students who are level one. Mm -hmm. Would I put it in their language? Would I translate it? You could. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I would probably, if you put it, I would probably give them a side-by-side -side comparison mm -hmm. and show, show it in English and in their, their native languages and okay. help them tease it out that way so they can okay. see what it looks like in English as well. So they're still doing the English learning, but they're able to get through it in their in their in their native languages yes absolutely okay yeah yeah and they might the interesting thing because especially like spanish and um sometimes german but a lot of times with spanish you'll start to see words that look similar yes so having a conversation around that and and letting them even notice you know how are these similar how are these different um because there are a lot of cognates between uh, Spanish and um, English. So that could be a very interesting conversation. Yeah, I'm gonna write yeah. that. Yeah, um, cool. So here's an example from New York. This is a grade three regents problem on the right. And so um, it says Beth met her friends at the library at 4.30 PM. It took her 24 minutes to walk from her house to the library. What time did Beth leave her house to arrive at? at the library at exactly 4.30 p.m. And so here you see, we have orientation. So Beth met her friends. Mm -hmm. um, we have the complication where is that um, she it took her 24 minutes to walk from her house to the library. And then we have the framework. So it, we're asking the readers to find that solution, right? So what we wanna know is what time did she leave her house to arrive at, to arrive at 4.30? Um, and so um, that's, a, that's very typical to how our math is, is um, our, sorry, narrative is dealt with in mathematics. Um, and then <laughs> I have a little note here. Um, a lot of times when the students are asked to show their work, a lot of times this can border on a different genre family because it can border on information report or sometimes explanation or even um, uh, argument sometimes because really they might be uh, the the intention might be for them to defend how they got their answer, not just to show it or display it. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting stuff. Um, so let's look at our examples again um, from first six and algebra two. So for let's talk about first grade and where do you see the orientation, the complication, and the frank and the and the framework for the resolution. Well, the orientation is telling you how many dolls each has. Mm -hmm. The complication is figuring out how many more. Mm -hmm. uh, and the framework for resolution. Mm -hmm. Maybe showing your work? I don't. Yeah, I, I actually think in this case, the complication and the framework might be the same sentence. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, think, I think it might be the same sentence in this case. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So let's look at uh, sixth grade. Yeah. So the orientation is again having the introduction of the prices. Mm -hmm. Um. Perhaps the complication, the first one, is having to add. Mm hmm. The second would be having to subtract. So there would be two complications. Mm -hmm. And then you have tax, right? On top of that. Right, right. Um, yeah. And then, you know, subtracting to find out the number, the amount of change. I think that would be a complication. And... Mm -hmm. You know, maybe I could be interpreting this wrong, but maybe a framework could be showing your work. It could be, um, although this question doesn't specifically ask you to do that. But I would say, you know, because if I if I gave you this, I gave you the first two sentences and no question, 
then you wouldn't know how to resolve it, right? Because I, I could ask you a million and five things, kind of like the visual oh. we had at the beginning. Oh, yeah. So, so I could ask you a lot of different things, but the the question itself tells you how I want you to get to a, re a resolution. Mm -hmm. So, okay. um, yeah. So there there is some complication and you have to figure out like in the in the general sense of the word complication uh, <laughs> that you have to figure out what's what to do and what's left. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say that last question, how much change should they get from $15 might be their framework for how to resolve this. Okay. Um, yeah, which can I, then lead back to what the complication is that I've got to figure out how to add, add all this stuff up and subtract it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's look at algebra two. Well, the first sentence is the introduction. Mm hmm Well, the complication is the, actually, maybe the complication is having to make a formula. Well, I don't think you have, to, I think the complication is present. I think the complication actually is if they worked together, if, if together they worked 20, 97 hours. And I would say that the framework for the resolution might be how many hours did each work? Ah, okay. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I was just going in order, but I guess you don't have to. Yeah, it, this is an interesting one because you, you, yeah, you don't necessarily have to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it's interesting. It's interesting stuff, but this is our typical way of looking at narrative in mathematics. So for the most part, I would say the big thing is you got to check for understanding. How are students making sense of uh, what they're reading. Um, so you we were talking about, we were talking about giving them the, the piece in, the, in their native language. Another strategy that I really love is um, the three read strategy. Do you know this one? No. Okay. So a lot of times, especially with word problems, we tell students to just keep reading it and, or read it and underline key information a lot, of, but that can be kind of out of order because sometimes they need to just figure out what's happening. And so that's what the three read, the three read says, yes, we read it, reread the problem, but read it for different things every time. Mm -hmm. so the first time they read the problem, what is it about? Is it about coffee? Is it about dolls? What's, what is it about? Mm -hmm. And then the second time they read it is what are they being asked to do? Because if you know what it's about, not, and you know what you're being asked to do, now you can move on to a third read and look at what your key information might be. Because um, if you're trying to read it and get the key information while you're trying to understand the problem, it's just too much happening at once. So let's just slow that process down a little bit and okay. chunk it so that by the time you do need to leave, uh, 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 move into um, key information and then find the solution, you, you're, you have a sense as to what's happening more, more readily. So that's one of my favorites. Another one, this is the Singapore bar method I was telling you about. Um, so in this case, we have a scenario of girls and boys. What, can, what else can you tell from this visual? Well, the total of girls and boys is 253. Mm -hmm. We don't know the number of boys. Um, we know the number of girls. <laughs> So we could find the number of boys. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because we know the total and we know how much one part of it is. Yeah. So this is where the Singapore bar method can be really helpful. Yes. If we can get to this kind of a diagram, then you can figure things out. And I never have to give you an algorithm. Right. Yeah. Because you can just make sense of it. Yes. Yeah, it, it's it's pretty cool that way. Yeah, <laughs> it is. I remember the first time I, I learned it, I was like, what? And I've been struggling trying to teach students how to do this, this, and that this, in, a, in a very particular way, right? Yeah. Um, you know, especially if you come through the, the math gate, uh, you know, when we're learning the content, we're told, we're taught to teach algorithms and it, math doesn't always require that. Sometimes yeah. it's helpful, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's just, making sense of what's happening and diagramming it out and then you can figure out where, where to go from there.
Yeah. So, so this is my spiel on narrative. Um, some other ways to check for understanding is you can use um, technology. So um, here's an example of a story that I wrote um, for another project. And, and what we did with the technology is put in little pieces to help students stop and think about different parts of what was happening in the problem. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean to turn 15 years old? What is a quinceanera? You know, what, what do these words mean? Honor and um, go back. Uh, reserve and you know process or party what do those things mean and then uh, having students think about what what have you have you used reservation in any other way uh, what might that story uh, sorry what what might it mean in this story um, and then this th there's layers to this if I put it in slideshow mode and there we go so you start asking questions at different points have you seen this word somewhere because we use it as an adjective instead of as a noun. Um, uh, and then here's some other words to think about, assisting, available, representative, what do all these mean? And then we give a, a, a hint. You know, So if a shape is polygonal and has four sides, what kind of shape is it? And so just ways to help students to think about things a little bit differently. So you can use like these little info bubbles, if you will. Mm -hmm. And um, tasks, um, has a, a wonderful website called UDL uh, Book Builder. And you can actually, you can use um, books that are already, or stories that have already been uploaded, or you can create your own. Um, mm -hmm. So this is one that one of my students did, um, that some students were moving. Uh, Ashlyn and Ariana are moving. And Print the reason to them, which is Previous really cool. page, disabled, of 10. Next page. Ashlyn and Ariana are moving. Okay, how do I get to the next Bye. page? I'm missing something. Alexandra Vidiello. Hide. Hey. So just you asked for the 10 minute warning. So I just wanted to let you know. Oh, is it is it? I thought it was 10 to 12. I'm sorry. Oh, fabulous. <laughs> Good. Oh, 90 minutes. It says here 90 minutes. Oh, it's 90? Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay good. We got a little more time. Okay. Wow. That's so weird. Okay. Uh, okay. So other technologies, there's GeoGebra, there's Desmos, there's TI Inspire, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then of course, make sure you check, double check the mathematics in existing texts because sometimes it could be a little weird. Um, but all that to say narrative, is, I love this quote, narrative is the heart of making sense of the world, world not completely buy into that. Um, cause it can really open the doors to a lot of things. So I start with narrative because again, narrative can go throughout all the other, um, ways we think about mathematics. So when we start thinking about explanation, um, of course the purpose is for us to give an account of how something works or occurs, tends to have a process focus, um, and tends to be concerned with a logical sequence. So um, this might, um, we might see explanation through mathematical tasks. We might see it in terms of multiple, multiple representations, or we might see it in discussions. Mm -hmm. uh, so here's an example of explanation here where we see some Legos being used to express multiplication. And then we keep going further to simplify and get to a, a final uh, concrete number. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, and then, oh, I'm sorry, back, back it up. So then again, in literacy, I'm sorry, um, that we might see symbols and or diagrams. Um, all right, keep going. Oh, wow, I'm so sorry. <laughs> this is supposed to be, ah, it's supposed to be, uh, it's not doing it for some reason. That's all right, it's. Ah. So let me take, let me do this. Yeah, these animations are hard to, yeah. yeah, well, you can see it's set up to do it on the side, but it's not doing it for some reason. Yeah. And we're skipping around for some reason. Why are we doing that? Let's go back. Oh, Lord. Okay, so let me do this so I can tell you. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. I should have triple checked this, huh? It's all right. I'm 
into it. Yeah, let me take the whole thing off. Oh. But anywho, the point of this slide is to show you that different organizations of visuals can help students see things, but without even the words being present. So I'm trying to get rid of some of this stuff. Let's do this and let's do this. Oh, I'm sorry, it's gonna take me a That's little okay. bit to do this. Um, but the whole point, point is if you see the one in the red, you, there's a hierarchy set up. So you kind of know that whatever's at the top then splits into three and then you can see what's happening under those three. Even if you don't understand the words, you can make some sense of it according to the visual. Right. Um, set up and like this one is let me see can I move it and this is aggravating I am so sorry don't worry you don't have a lot of time <laughs> but this one is more of a um, process oriented visual um, so it's going from one thing to the next to the next and this actually is a representation of um, the order of operations uh, where we think about, we do grouping first, then we do expo exponents, then we do multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction. Um, this one is more of a cycle. Ah, I'm about to get rid of that for a second because it's just driving me nuts. Um, I'm just going to turn on the air conditioning. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> it's a little warm in here. It's getting too, hot in my apartment. Yeah. I don't know why it's not letting me move things properly. Oh. Yeah, here we go. So yeah, so this is a cycle scenario. So we can kind of see that one thing leads to a next and it keeps going. And so I used um, the notion of uh, checking your answers um, because that can be cyclical, especially if, if, the, if, the, if you test it, if you try to solve an equation, you test the, the answer that you got and, it, and it's not work and it doesn't work, then you got to try another one. You know, so that 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 becomes a, a cyclical a cyclical process as well. But again, there's things we can tell. It doesn't even matter what's in the box or in those boxes necessarily, because depending on how it's set up, it can give students some indication of what's happening before we ever get into the terminology. Right. So that's the point of this slide here. Mm -hmm. Ugh, so mad at that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hate stuff like that. Ah, oh God. Okay. Thank you. You know you did it right, and then it still doesn't work with you. Okay. So let's look at this example here. Um, and it's called Sarah's Candies. It's an example that's called Sarah's Candies. We're gonna do the three read. I'm gonna have you do the three read for this to get it started, and then we'll we'll take it from there. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna give you the link to a Google Doc that you can copy so that you can write into it yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Were you able to get that document? Um, let me see. Uh, hang on, it's opening. <laughs> Taking a minute to open. Yes, I just got it. Okay, great. So you can copy that and use it, or you can just write on a piece of paper right now, but we're going to actually do the three read process. Great. Um, and so what I do with teachers in particular is I read it out loud first. <laughs> teachers will start working with it and start trying to figure it out before you go through the process. So I'm going to read it through one. One time and the first thing you're going to figure out is 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 the first box what's the context what is this what is this question about mm -hmm. uh, and so here it is so sarah had a bag of candies she gave one third of her candies to rebecca then sarah gave one fourth of the candies she had left to john after giving candies to rebecca and john sarah had 24 candies left in her bag how many candies were in the bag to start mm -hmm. so what is this about well, this is about determining, um, hang on, I'm, I'm still reading the other document. Oh, it's okay. Okay. So we're just looking at that first, the first box, the context. So what is the question even talking about? I mean, that question, but the prompts. 
you know, I'm sorry, I don't see the prompt. I'm going back. You don't see it yet. That's deliberate. That's oh, deliberate. So I just heard it. Yeah, yeah. So you just heard it. Yep. Can you say it one more time? <laughs> I'm the bad student. <laughs> so okay, I'll read it again. Sarah had a bag of candies. She gave one third of her candies to Rebecca. Then Sarah gave one fourth of the candy she had left to John. And after giving candies to Rebecca and John, Sarah had 24 candies left in her bag. How many candies were in the bag to start? All right. Um, so you're just trying to figure out the- What's it about? Oh, it's about Sarah and John, or it's about uh, Sarah sharing her candy with Rebecca and John. And maybe I would stop there. Yeah, that's, that's all you good. need. Yeah, that's okay. good. So I'm going to read it again this time and you're going to determine what is the question or what is the scenario asking you to do, okay? All right. So Sarah had a bag of candies. She gave one third of her candies to Rebecca. Then Sarah gave one fourth of the candy she had left to John. After giving candies to Rebecca and John, Sarah had 24 candies left in her bag. How many candies were in the bag to start? All right. So I think the first complication is how many are. So you're being asked to find out how many Rebecca and John got. Well, it doesn't ask you that directly. There's only one thing it asks directly. Um, maybe how many did she get? Oh, no. Well, what was the total, I think? Well, they asked you to find out how many candies were in the bag to start with. How many okay. did Sarah start with? Yeah. So that's the that's the primary question. Now, there's a whole lot of, of how you get to that point, right? Yeah. Um, at this point, this is when I give teachers the actual text. Here it is. <laughs> we'll read it again. And this time you're going to pull out key information. Okay. Okay. So Sarah had a bag of candies. She gave one third of her candies to Rebecca. Then Sarah gave one fourth of the candy she had left to John. After giving candies to Rebecca and John, Sarah had 24 candies left in her bag. How many candies were in the bag to start? So what's some key information you're seeing in here? She gave a third to Rebecca, a quarter to John, and she had 24 left mm -hmm. after doing that. Mm -hmm. Great, great, great. So from this point, I would have students go in this in this kind of order, give them some individual think time to draw a diagram that represents the important information, not to solve it, but just to represent the important information. And then I would have them work together to talk about how, how their representations um, differ or are similar. And then um, from there to determine what would be a diagram that you think would best represent the important information. Um, and then after that, we would share out. And then we would start talking about how you could actually find the answers from the diagrams that we see. And then what makes, what's important for us to take away about drawing good diagrams in mathematics to help us make sense of these kind of problems and help us solve them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so these are some examples of, of uh, what students have done. Um, so this is a bar that a student did and they divided it up into thirds initially so that Rebecca got that third and then they divided it up again, the, the remaining third into fourth so that John got that part. And then they started dividing, you know, there's 24 here. So they started subdividing from there. Um, so that's one way to represent the problem and solve it. Um, here's a pie model. Um, where you have a, a whole pie. Rebecca got a third of that pie. John got a fourth of what was left. The remaining part, which was half the circle, was had was 24. So they divided up that part so that, uh, and then they could figure out how much each person had and what the total was at the beginning. So that's another way. 
Here's some more ways. <laughs> Here's a rectangular array uh, oh, that was done. So they divided it up. So Rebecca got this third and then we divided up this part so that John got a four. And then subdivided the whole thing into equal parts so that this they could tell what was left in that 24, that area of 24. Uh, and so when they divided up those pieces, they ended up with one, two, three, four, five, six, 24. Okay, so it's 24 here. And each part was worth four, so then they could figure out what everybody else had. Mm -hmm. um, and then this one was kind of a, a hierarchy, you know, and it really shows a process. So we don't know how many there is initially. We divide it up into thirds. Here's Rebecca's third, and then here's dividing it up into fourths so that John gets one fourth, and this is how much Sarah has, and then we can start dividing it up more, more to figure out how and the backtrack to figure out how much each person had, which they figure out um, Sarah actually had 24, I'm sorry, 48 at the beginning. Okay. What are you thinking about these diagrams? <laughs> I think they would be hard for me to figure out and maybe okay. the students, but on the slide before, I think huh? they would be a little easier. Okay. We use tape diagrams, so they uh -huh. might be familiar with the first one. Mm hmm. And so, yeah, so here's another way of using them. Yeah, actually. Um, and, and depending on how students set them up, will give you an, a, a sense of their understanding of the English as well as the content, you know, mm -hmm. and so you can help them really tease out all of that piece. But it doesn't matter. They, they don't you can see that they don't have to use the tape diagram. It's great because they can see another use for it. But they can use circles, they can use the rectangular arrays, they can make a flow chart looking piece. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to represent it. Yeah. What are your thoughts so far? <laughs> um, well, they would definitely have to be in groups. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> I think there might be some frustration. Okay. Um, How so? But it would certainly make them have to think. Mm hmm Yeah. And we've done this. Um, I pulled this from some work I did with in middle school, actually. Okay. Um, some middle school math courses. And it's specifically, we did it with multilingual learners. Okay. Um, and they really got into it. And we had oh. big discussions about, okay, so what do you, when you draw a diagram, in mathematics, what needs to be there? So we talked about how it needs to be labeled and you can put colors to help you, you know, tease things out. Sort of like um, this one with the different, you know, it was hard to show colors on here, but basically that was trying to, they were trying to differentiate um, the different sections. And if so, if we had been, they had markers, they would have done that. Um, mm -hmm. Making sure you, you know, uh, make things even. So you wouldn't draw a bag <laughs> and try to figure it out. You would draw some shape that you could divide up evenly so that you could, you know, make a good diagram and that kind of thing. So we would have those kind of conversations. You can solve it, but that wasn't the point. The point was getting you to a point of making sense of the English you were reading. And perhaps you provide the problem in a, a, a first language as well, but making sense of the problem itself mm -hmm. and then thinking about the ways in which you could um, uh, go about trying to solve it using visuals. Um, mm -hmm. Could I teach you a, a, an algorithm and how to make this into an equation and solve it? I absolutely could, but do I need to? Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. It's true. Um, go ahead. <laughs> Seven. Okay, all right. Let Oh, yeah, I mean, I mean, and that's the interesting thing because you'll you'll find like so if we're thinking about getting students ready for state exams and stuff, very rarely are our students asked to solve things in a very particular way. And even for the best of us, when we talk about using math and everyday language, it is very rare that I will pull out a piece of paper and make a make an you know make an equation. But I will reason things through and diagram them out. And I and math is my thing. And I don't do that all the time. The real, the real world use for mathematics really has nothing to do with algorithms, but rather thinking through what's happening and, and thinking more critically and sort of 
teasing things out that way. Could I do it? Do it? Do a equation for most things? Yeah, I could. That's not what I'm going to lean to, though. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I think that approach makes math more useful mm -hmm. as well. So you don't get the question as much about well, why. When am I going to use this? Well, you're going to reason through things the rest of your life. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh. So let's talk about information report a little bit. Okay. So information report, um, we use it to inform or describe, to record, organize, and store information, and uh, especially relating to categories of things. So the way the text is organized, there's usually some opening statement or classification. We give some facts about whatever it is. Uh, and this usually involves a lot of technical language. Uh, tier three and tier two um, language that we have to, you know, specifically teach. Um, and so the, what this might look like, of course, uh, we might have students reading textbooks or listening to teacher presentations. Uh, expressively, we might have students do a presentation to show their work, uh, write a report, or do some sort of collaborative task. Mm -hmm. um, and I really like I'm going to give you this link. Um, this visual here. This is um, a visual a visual that was developed by Karen Robinson, mm -hmm. and what it does is it it maps blooms and language together, and how they might fall together. And so you can see in terms of information report that tends to fall under um, the understanding comprehension area where mm -hmm. they have to explain something or match it or reorganize or illustrate. That, that's where that tends to come. So you can get a good sense of students understanding in when it comes to information report. So this is just for information report. This is just for information. Okay. Yeah, and I think it, it can help you plan out and think about more strategically about what's happening in math, depending on what you want them to do. And actually this is not even just math specific, this is education across the board. So it's kind of a cool diagram. Yeah. I pull, I, I pull on a lot. So, uh oh, alrighty. I think I got rid of the wrong thing. Yeah, I did. Okay, nope, that's not what I want. <laughs> that's all right. Oh, I'm going nuts. Okay, there we go. So um, you can use visuals and other activities to help students speak or write. So if I want students to brainstorm uh, about something, then we might use a concept map. If I want them to define or investigate something, we might use a Freyer model. And I particularly like Freyer models in terms of thinking about examples versus non-examples because it's good to know what something is but it's also good to know what it's not mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so in terms let's say we were looking at parallelograms so i might have pictures of um squares and rhombi and other things under examples but then under non-examples i might have a picture of a trapezoid or a kite which you know and so it's very if i want students to be able to distinguish those things this is a good way to do that of course, the Venn diagram is completely helpful. Uh, love it and can to help us compare and contrast. And then there's exercises such as a word sort that can help us categorize and link um, different terms together. Uh, this is a science example, but I've done this in math as well, mm -hmm. uh, uh, where I just give students a list of words and they have to determine what categories, how they would categorize those 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 words, and then give them a category title. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it's very interesting. So there's, I usually go a more open way with their open way where I let them decide what the titles are, especially at the beginning. And then if I use it again at the end of a lesson or a unit, then then I might say, I want you to use these these categories. And where would you put these words? That mm -hmm. kind of thing. And and it, and that gives me a sense of their learning, one of those formative assessments of how what they've learned. Mm -hmm. um, so these are some ways to integrate visuals and information report. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, of course, um, like I said, a lot of information report involves specific vocabulary. So you want to think about ways to teach vocabulary um, that involve visuals as well. So Freyer model is one way um, 
a word splash can be a different way because it's he's like, oh, I got words turned on different crazy ways. It's just it kind of looks fun, <laughs> like graffiti, yeah. especially if you start putting them in different colors and stuff like that. Um, and for this, you would just ask students to um, use words in a sentence or or in a paragraph or a drawing even. Um, these words would be kind of hard to do that for most of them because this is uh, this is algebra. Is this algebra two? Yeah, this is the algebra two, and it's really complex. It gets into conjugations and rhymes, so that might be a little beyond this. But it can be open or closed, and it can be great for pre and post assessments. Um, so you just take some words that you want students to use, and they don't all have to be your tier three words like rhyming or you know, differentiate, but they can be words like zero and factor and some of those directive words that students might have to use. Like if I, I mean, I have to tell students to conjugate things and, you know, function can be used in a lot of different ways. So you can throw in some, you can really mix up the kind of words you use um, to get a sense of what students know. And then here's another example that I like to use called concept circles. And so for this, you divide up um, a circle into three to six sections. You put a term or a picture in each of those sections, and then you have the students to think about the common attributes and then to name the relationship. So it becomes what the concept is. So, um, and then there's ways to vary that. So we're gonna start with this one. So what would you call, looking at these figures, what would you call this concept? Um. I would, I mean, so the concept is kind of what they're being what's asked the to do. Yeah what's, the, yeah, what's the theme of this? The of theme of figures? this is comparing figures. Okay, but what kind of figures are they? Why would they all be together? Well, I mean, I would say four-sided, but then you've got the triangle. Mm -hmm. Um, you can find the area of each. Um, what is the common thing? Um, they all have sides. I mean, that's kind okay. of obvious. Yeah, that's where I'm going with that. <laughs> oh, okay. so I would say they're all polygons. Straight lines. Okay. They're, they're all polygons, you know? Okay. So they're 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 figures with those straight with with straight lines as their um or segments as their sides, yeah they're all polygons. Okay. Um, for this one, a variation is you can have the students determine what should go in there. Okay. That's where the question mark is for. So you have the students say, okay, well if these are your other figures, what would the concept be? So I might say, okay, well I've got a square, I got a rectangle, I got a triangle. I'm probably looking at polygons. And then I can put in whatever polygon I want to figure or have the students put in the, the you know, what the fourth one would be. So it could be a hexagon, it'd be a dodecagon, whatever. As long as it's a polygon, it would fit. Um, I mean, you could even make an argument that a circle could fit if you say that we're just talking about two dimensional figures. Um, uh, so if you go more general than polygons, you could say two dimensional figures and do it that way as well. Okay. And then here's one other example. This one is, what's your concept and what does it belong? <laughs> well, they're all shapes. <laughs> okay. Which one doesn't belong? The bottom right. Okay. And why? Because it has a curved line. Okay. And once it has a curve, it's no longer a polygon then. Right, right. Yeah. Good. Good. So that's a way to use concept circles. And again, I'm not giving you any words. You just look at the pictures and I can put words in here and I, I, I have used it with words, but I don't have to. Okay. I can just use pictures and let them figure it out. Okay. Have conversations around that. Um. So let's see, what kind of time do we have? Uh, I'm going to take a picture of this. Yeah. So this is a problem I wanted us to take a look at. Um, it's called the window problem. I don't I don't know about time, though. I think I might keep moving. Okay. But um, I think I'll show you. I'll give you a gist of what it's about, though. Okay. <laughs> um, so for this one... 
It's a problem. There's my chat. Okay. And so the okay. problem is this. You have a company that's putting together square windows from three different kinds of units. They have the corner pane, there's the center pane, and there's the edge pane. And all of these can be turned around in different ways. Okay. Uh, so your job would be to label the row, complete the labeled row, I'm sorry, in the table. Uh, and you then um, you can add extra rows if you want to, and then look for patterns and generate equations that would allow uh, the peerless production manager to calculate the number of each type of pane he'll need for any size square window. So with this, um, I start I always start my students with drawing things out. So I usually give them graph paper. Um, let me go back. Yeah. So you'll see the second page is a big old graph sheet of graph paper. So you can start actually teasing out what these square, and I give them uh, even adults, I give them some colored pencils, like draw it out <laughs> yeah. because it helps you make sense of it very quickly. And what you'll see as you draw it is that yeah, blah, blah. once you start seeing in the drawings is these are the corners. If the red ones are the corners, then when, as you start expanding, so this is a two by two. <laughs> um, this is a three by three. And when I have three by three, there's one of those center panes. There's one, two, three, four of the edge panes. And I still have my four corner panes. And then you can keep, then I can expand to a four by four. Now I have four in the middle. I've got the four on the round, uh, four corners. And I've got the, I've got eight edge panes. And it just keeps going from there. And that helps me to fill out this table and end up with these equations. Because no matter what, I have four corners period. I always have four corners. So that's a constant equation of just C equals four. The edge pane goes up by four every single time. So that that ends up being an equa equation that looks something like this, doesn't have to be exactly like that. And then um, the uh, center panes are interesting because they become squares. And so my, my equation ends up looking something like this. Um, the another way I can look at this is using a program like Desmos, and it can help me figure this out. Um, and I, or I can draw things out on there, and and it can be really helpful. Now, here's the trick. Um, I can ask students, you know, how are these? How do the different functions vary from each other? Because again, we have a constant. We've got this one, the e. We've got the t. Um, and what's fun to do is to actually plot the three of them. And you can really have a good conversation around what do you see? So the constant one is completely horizontal. I'm always at four for the corner panes. For the, the, the edge panes, I, I have a linear function because you see my straight line and the square one gives me a parabola. Hmm. Wow. So we can talk about how they're similar, how they're different. You know, the fact that the corner pane is, is, is linear and the edge panes are linear, what does that mean? Why are they different, you know? Um, whereas, you know, and then, you know, how, how do they all compare to one another? So we can have really rich conversations just using what this presents um, and, and those kind of categories. So I love this problem for that. <laughs> And then you can talk about what, you know, the characteristics, have students make charts about what characteristics we can figure out through the tables. What can we figure out through equations? What do we see in graphs? Um, and, and how are they similar and different from one another, depending on the kind of function we have. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sorry, let me stop here. Questions about that one? No, I think you <laughs> So we have eight minutes left. Yes. You can keep going if you would like, but it was, I mean, I'm sorry, maybe, maybe it is supposed to be two hours, but um, I just don't want to take up your time. Oh, so no, I'm good. I prepared for two hours, so I'm good, <laughs> but I'm going to go through it since, it's, since you had an hour and a half. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go. Great. 
real quickly through the last one. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, so the last the last one is argument. Uh-huh. Um, and so um, of course, the point is to take a position and justify it. Um, you usually have a statement of position, um, you usually, and then some supporting facts, and then a summary of position. So this shows up in math tasks, um, questioning techniques like question as a statement, or classroom activities like debates or four corners. Um, are you familiar with those activities, four corners? In question and statement? Is that where people go to each different corner yes. depending yes. on what they Their think? Their stances, and yep. And yeah, and so you can do that in math too. It's kind of fun. So um, the trick to the text organization is you may not need all three of those pieces. Sometimes you can do the statement, depending on what the prompt asks you to do. Sometimes you can do the statement and supporting facts, or you can do supporting facts and the summary. That just depends on the, how it goes. And I'll show you an example of that in a moment. But okay. yeah, for, here's, here's one example that I give um, a lot. Our, our, uh, the statement is that all squares are rectangles. And then my students will have to go to each of the four corners depending on what they believe. Um, mm -hmm. Turns out this is completely true. But even if they don't think, even if they don't strongly agree, um, uh, you know, it, it, it lends itself to a lot of conversation um, about what, um, uh, what squares are, what rectangles are, how do you know? you know, that kind of thing. Um, and so that's an, another way. And that's a way to be more kinesthetic. It's not necessarily a picture, but it's a way to be kinesthetic. Yeah. Um, and so kind of questions we might ask for argument um, are, you know, is there a better solution to something? Do you think that something is good or bad? What changes would you make? What are some pros and cons? That kind of thing. And argument falls under this notion of evaluating, uh, of evaluating or synthesis. Uh, when it comes to Bloom's taxonomy. Um, and so, you know, we start thinking about um, considering and waiting. These are the kind of content things that we have our students do. And these are kind of functions, language functions they would need to do, conclude or defend or infer, uh, assess. I love those. Um, and so um, for literacy, teach the text organization to your students, like to show them some sample text, um, like release student work. Um, I know we can get a lot of release student work through uh, state or state exams now and see what students are, are writing and, and have students sort of tease that, tease that out and talk about, you know, how those could be exemplars or not exemplars. Compare a lower score and a higher score and see what they think. Yeah. Um, some highlighting activities. And I love writing frames like uh, the uh, rewrite and thinks persuasion map. I love this. <laughs> I've never seen the persuasion. Though. You've never seen it? And I've it's actually it. interactive too. Um, so you can actually, I'm gonna show you this website. So you can print out the PDF or you can like enter your name and then actually it'll walk you through. Let me see. Yeah, I'm just gonna throw some stuff in there. So it'll walk you through what is your thesis? And then it takes you to you writing out your reasons for those theses and then what are some facts or examples for each one of your reasons? So it gets really in depth um, and you could have students skip around. Yeah. And at the end, it'll show what you wrote and you can print that out. It's so great. <laughs> it is fantastic. Wow. I absolutely love that one. I do, I do. Let me give you the link here so you can have it for um, your own. Ah, uh, shoot, where's the link go? Go back. Go back. Oh, there we go. Oh, I thought I had the link here. All right, let me let me go. It's all right. I can just Google it. Okay, I got it. I can just copy it from here. Okay, thank you. I thought I had it in my notes. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. That's good. Well, I love every it. subject. It is, and I've used it in every subject. <laughs> Wow. And this is awesome. Even um, I was working, and I remember the first time I used it, actually, I was working with some students who were in juvenile and they loved it. Wow. And it really engaged them in, um, in writing a persuasive essay. It, it was, it was amazing. Um, so, it. Um, and then and the other things, you know, teach students to use a, a accountable talk, right? So these are the kind of sentence stems that you would use uh, if you want to do a, uh, 
uh, say that you agree or you disagree or you know you're thinking about this and this what this person said makes me think about something else so teach them these these structures um uh here's some more oh, excuse me you know how to ask about for clarification or how to summarize something so some sentence stems and questions that can help students do that um and so um here is uh, a final example um, about um, uh, uh, an art class project. And so it comes with this lovely graph where an art teacher um, needs to buy 20 t-shirts for a class project. She can buy the t-shirts at a local store. This graph shows the cost in dollars for different numbers of t-shirts. So the teacher could buy the t-shirts online for three fifty each, she would also pay a fee of nine fifty for shipping the, sh the 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 shirts. Teacher wants to spend uh, the least amount of money. Should she buy the twenty shirts from the local store or online? It and here's the thing: it says show or explain how you got your answer, but really, that means to justify or defend why you got your answer. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't even take words to uh, sp uh at 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 you know, according to what they say sometimes, because even though it's saying to explain, it's not really explanation, it's really an argument. This is why she should buy 20 shirts from the local store. Um, so this is um, something that, um, again, go back, go back, go back. You could use Desmos uh, where you put the points in and then you can have students manipulate it and figure things out or add, you can add, they can add more points, all that kind of thing using Desmos. And I, I choose Desmos because it's free and it's online. Yeah, we use Desmos to practice yeah. for yeah. state tests. I really like them, yeah. And so, um, yeah, so we have students go through that process um, and then you can compare. So think here's um, a, a couple of high level responses to this question. Um, oh, good Lord. So in this case, no summary was given, but the student starts out with the statement of their position. The, the teacher should buy the 20 shirts from online because um, they will save $20.50. And then they show their supporting facts or evidence. So they created these equations, they teased it out and then subtracted, what they didn't, don't show is how they subtracted 20, uh, 79.50 from the 100, and that's how they got the 2050. Uh, and then here's another student response, has all of it, uh, has some supporting facts. They start off with this, y equals five x, and here's the second equation. Um, and then she says, uh, she should buy them online. And then here's some more. If you plug 20 into x for both of these expressions, the function for the cost, and the shirts online has a lesser result. So this person did it from a different aspect. Instead of finding the 20, they just plug 20 in as an option um, and to see which way it would, which one would be better. Would that be trial and error? That would be a trial and error one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 They wrote equations to, to they wrote equations to, um, to represent the two, different stores but then yeah they just plugged it in you know because that was you were basing it on 20 20 shirts and you don't need to try yeah. all the different numbers right <laughs> just plug in 20 which yeah. one works yeah Great. so so here there's no official statement of position but the argument is still made yeah you know? and that's yeah. okay that's okay um so bringing this all together well, we're not going to do a cool down. I was going, we were going to do one more exercise if we had it. Um, <laughs> okay. So, um, 32, but you can keep going. I just know some, I'm going to wrap us up real quick. Okay. Um, so the, the first thing I always say is functional language is not boring. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of interactive ways to engage students. Um, this um, blog from um, someone, uh, this, uh, I can't remember his first name, but Blankman talks about seven strategies to engage math, uh, to, uh, teaching math to um, English language learners. Mm -hmm. uh, number six, his strategy number six is use tools, visual models, and manipulatives. So um, mathematics welcomes the visuals. Again, uh, typically the, the issue is language, not their knowledge. 
Um, you do have interrupted schooling scenarios, of course, so that's a different case. But a lot of times they, they can piece things together even with limited schooling because they just have a sense of the real world. Yeah. Um, um, all students um, with sight, at least for visuals, can, be, can benefit from this. And that's an important distinction. Um, you know, we can say that visuals are good teaching for the masses, but for our multilingual learners, they're essential. And that's a that's a big distinction because I know a lot of times we'll say, well, it's good for everybody. This is true, but for our multilingual learners, it can be essential for their uh, their learning mm -hmm. um, because they're trying to learn our language as well. Um, digital models can be just as effective, uh, and just know that students from different countries may know or use different models. And I was at a talk um, at uh, Southeast TESOL last fall, and Andrea um, Honigsfeld said this that using visuals means changing the language density, but not the rigor. So that's why a lot of the examples I have still have the rigor of the mathematics, but it's just changing what the language looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's in the representation or how we make sense of it, there's, there's just different things we can do to lessen that language density or to tease through it, help students tease their ways through it. Um, and this, here's an example of long division. <laughs> this is yeah. how keep it in, uh, you know, teaching the U.S. and you're seeing this, but in Venezuela, they do it this way. In France, they do it this way, you know? So I remember I had a student from Norway who did division a different way. Um, some some teach a repeated subtraction versus uh, the standard algorithm. So just know that that might happen. And <laughs> and that's okay. If, if that's what they're comfortable with and they can arrive, they can be just as accurate. I, I say, let them have it. Um, I let my student from Norway tell me that he wanted to learn a different way. He's yeah. like, that's so much shorter than what we do. <laughs> Show me. Oh, <laughs> I know. You know, so, but yeah. that's my two cents. Um, if you have any questions, you can feel free to email me. Okay. I'm sorry. I've got somebody knocking at my door repeatedly. <laughs> Okay. Well, know. thank you so much. Well, thank you. This has been great. I appreciate okay. it. Okay. okay. If I can be of any support going forward, you have my email. All right. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hey, who is this? I'm on a call. Okay. What do you need? Uh, okay, goodbye.